Hello, BookTube. I've got mail for you. I know I was lamenting just yesterday that the publishing industry would slowly dwindle and then die off, only to be reborn from its own ashes in the new year. But apparently the publishing industry did not get the memo this time around. There's a, fair, a fairly large amount of stuff to go through here with you, so I thought we'd just go through it together. I like, I like going through the mail uh, with you. Uh, just to see what might be of interest here at the very end of the year. Uh, these will almost certainly all be next year. Oh, oh my, okay. This next one is April. Several of you have pointed out, just uh, paying attention to mail halls here on this channel, several of you have pointed out that April looks like it's going to be my next tsunami month, like October was. That looks like it could be true. Uh, it looks like April will be when the publishing industry really swings back into gear. Uh, but this one is not uh, completely new to me. I read a chunk of it already and was very impressed. <laughs> uh, this is, uh, let's see, we'll make sure the lighting works here. This is Nama by Sarah Blake. Uh, I don't know how well you can make that out there. What will work? That will work. But then I have to lean forward and that takes work. <laughs> anyway, this is, you can look it up uh, uh, and get a perfect picture of it. This is Nama, a novel by Sarah Blake. Uh, and it's about the wife of the mythical Noah of Noah's Flood, uh, and it's her debut. It's a never-foretold story of a fierce, grief-stricken woman, the wife of Noah, the God-fearing Ark Builder. Nama has the burden of ensuring that all life on Earth continues while grieving for the friends and loved ones lost in the Flood. In the tradition of the best-selling novels like The Red Tent, The Paris Wife, and Loving Frank, all of which are not biblical historical fiction, instead they're all about uh, women in relationships with raging a-holes. <laughs> Seems to be a weird and very profitable subgenre of fiction. I don't get it. Uh, Blake takes this matriarch, who is barely a footnote in the Bible, and gives her a beautiful and unexpected voice that reverberates into the modern era. Uh, and that you ordinarily on this channel, you would expect that a lot of that is just publicity speak, but... <laughs> Uh, no, <laughs> no, the the uh, part of the chunk of this book that I read already, I will gladly read the rest of it next year, but the chunk that I read already was significantly better than any of those books mentioned and uh, really, really revolves around uh, Nama's voice, uh, around her as a character. Just, <laughs> we'll see, we'll wait and see, but I think this is further proof that, I mean, this is a fairly broad umbrella term here, but I think this is further proof of my uh, my belief that 2019 is going to be a great year for historical fiction. Uh, this isn't this is set in Judeo-Christian myth rather than history, but it it has historical trappings in it. Uh, there are no airplanes. <laughs> That's a friend of mine always uh, always used to wryly comment about historical fiction. Oh, there are no airplanes, right? Oh, okay, then it's uh, it's historical fiction. <laughs> uh, so, but anyway, uh, it it counts as a quasi recommendation until the new year. I'm not going to recommend anything for the new year explicitly until we get there, but. Uh, the chunk that I read was genuinely impressive. Uh, so, oh, okay. All right. This is also going to be, oh no, this is, this comes out on December 31st. I could actually read this if I wanted to. And I do. Uh, okay. This is, uh, a thriller by Kay Hooper. This is Final Shadows, uh, the, which is the third and final book in the acclaimed Bishop Files series, uh, Tasha Solomon has made every effort to conceal her psychic abilities from the world. But secrets can be deadly, and now that hers have been exposed, Tasha is being hunted by invisible enemies who want her destroyed. John Brody has devoted his life to protecting psychics from such villains. He is a member of an underground network that rescues psychics from imminent danger. He is Tasha's perfect match. Uh, but when Tasha and John hear the screams of unborn psychic babies dying in the night, they must work to protect more than just each other. More lives, even the fate of the world as they know it, may be in their hands. Uh, and I read, I didn't read the first book in this series, I read the second book. So this, I, this, this will be flowing on from a book I've already read, but I still feel like I missed a, a, a crucial bit of momentum in the story. Uh, but anyway, let's, uh, let's move on here. This, this, uh, I've, I've got, uh, this mail hall ends in a couple of boxes, and one of them is enormous. And I don't think it's from a publisher. Uh, so it could, we, we end with a mystery box. Uh, but let's see. Let's see what this next one is. Mm, what is this next one? Oh, God. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, this comes out in late May, and I was, I have been instructed by many people, many of you now, uh, to give you a warning, uh, like a trigger warning, if I'm going to mention contemporary poetry. 
Because well, the contemporary poetry is getting such a bad rap on this channel. I feel bad about that. I'm going to fix that in 2019. I'm going to read every piece of, uh, read critically, every piece of contemporary poetry that comes to me. I'm going to try and learn about it, too. Uh, maybe even with a goal of, for my epic Steve Reed's year-end list in 2019, having a poetry category. Wouldn't that be something? Uh, but anyway, that's what this is. <laughs> this is Little Glass Planet by Dobby Gibson. It is a stereotypical slim volume of poetry. Uh, so what have we got here? Uh, this book exalts in the strangeness of the known and the unknowable world. In poems set as far afield as Mumbai and Marfa, Gibson maps disparate landscapes, both terrestrial and subliminal, to reveal the drama in both the extraordinary and the mundane. Uh, and Dobby Gibson is the author of Polar, which won the Alice James Award. Uh, and his poetry has appeared in Fence, New England Review, and Plowshares, and he lives in St. Paul. In uh, poor, underrated St. Paul. <laughs> uh, so, do we dare? <laughs> Book two, do we dare? Uh, let's see if Dobby has ever written a small poem, a short poem, and then we will read it. Since I've given you a trigger warning, we will read it. Uh, okay, here's one. Uh, this one is titled, I Can Do It All in My Lifetime. <clears throat> if I were to say the subjunctive is indistinguishable from the machinations of mourning itself, would that put me even more under its spell? In the repair shop garage, the most broken down cars sleep on the top bunk, while on the edge of town, pylons trim the highways to one lane, stopping traffic for miles, all for a steamroller abandoned in the rain. It's as close to forever as it's possible to know. Have you ever felt so alone that it was oddly also impossible to only to be only yourself? Then you know what it's like to not have a name, only a sense of lightness and a suspicion that everything is uncalled for. And for reasons no one can understand, we still believe that for our children it will not be too late. Okay. All right. Well, I like that. It's certainly eloquent. And it has a wonderful way with words. But on the first reading, anyway, I'm going to give it a lot of patient consideration, all of this stuff. I'm not going to shoot from the hip. But on the first reading, it seems like this is about three different things. It's, it seems like it bounces around. Uh, unless maybe I'm being misled by the author's misunderstanding of what the subjunctive is? I don't know. Maybe not. Uh, in the repair shop garage, the most broken down cars sleep on the top bunk. What does that mean? That isn't true, right? Spatially speaking, that isn't true. Uh, while on the edge of town, pylons trim the highway to one lane, stopping traffic for miles, all for a steamroller abandoned in the rain. Okay, but that isn't true either, right? A, a, a truly abandoned steamroller would be moved away by by the the highway department, by the works department. So is it that is the author saying that the pylons are there and shifting traffic for a steamroller that has been abandoned because work crews won't work in the rain? Is that it, it, that that strikes me as an image that the author saw while driving on a road, and thought that would work well in a poem, but does it? The the steamroller in question, if so, has not been abandoned. It, it's just that work crews don't work in the rain, but the next day when it's sunny. The pylons will still be there, the traffic will still be diverted, but the steamroller will be in use and surrounded by other machines that are in use. In other words, not subjunctive. Those machines won't be disused anymore. I... Have you ever felt so alone that it was oddly also impossible to be only yourself? Okay, all right, well, uh... At least that wasn't just explicitly bad. That that gives you that gives me hope. That gives me plenty to think about. So this comes out in May, in a paperback, uh, and I will be right on it. <laughs> I will be right on it. Uh, all right. So we're gonna, I'm going to make a pile here on my lap. So uh, we're getting there. We're we're getting close here. Uh, I hope you all survive that reading. But I think I think you'll admit, uh, even from the little bits that we've seen here on this channel, that that wasn't as bad as some of the stuff that we've seen at all. Uh, well, let's see here. What's next? Uh, first week in January. Uh, oh, my. Oh, my. Okay, this is uh, by Kathleen Day. It's called Broken Bargain. Bankers, bailouts, and the struggle to tame Wall Street. Uh, in the 1930s, battered and humbled by the Great Depression, 
The U.S. financial sector struck a grand bargain with the federal government. Bankers gained a safety net in exchange for certain curbs on their freedom. Transparency rules, record-keeping, and anti-fraud measures, and fiduciary responsibilities. While these regulations have changed over time, the underlying bargain played a major role in preserving the stability of the financial markets and the larger economy. By the free market era of the 1980s and 90s, however, Wall Street argued that rules embodied in New Deal era regulations to protect consumers and ultimately taxpayers were no longer needed, and government agreed. In this book, the author shows how the new bargain between the government and Wall Street evolved with taxpayers footing the bill. Uh, of course, the, the, under, the underlying assumption there is entirely true. The only way that Wall Street will work, that, that for-profit money and, and technology speculations will work, so as not to tank the, the economy of an entire country, including the vast majority of people in that country who neither know nor care anything about Wall Street, the only way that that system will work is if it's heavily regulated by the government. I hate to say that, <laughs> of course. I hate to say that more than a lot of you think I do. A lot of you are laboring under the impression that I am, as one of you put it, a lefty. <laughs> that is not true. <laughs> Nevertheless, this is, this is a galling thing for me to admit, but one of the things that Noam Chomsky has been saying for 50 years that I agree with, I don't agree with a lot of what he says, but one of the things he's been saying for 50 years that I agree with is that the, the uh, free market capitalism is a myth. That the minute you that you the minute you do that, weird things start to happen, and the government needs to intervene. Otherwise, catastrophe ensues. And every time the government lightens its its restrictions, catastrophe does inevitably ensue, like night following day. Uh, I tend to agree with that, and I, I don't know. Well, actually, what who who is uh, Kathleen Day? And she's at home. She's worked uh, for 30 years as a business journalist with the Washington Post, the LA Times, and USA Today. Okay, so she knows her subject backwards and forwards. That's great. And she also knows how to write snappy prose, or she wouldn't have kept those jobs. Uh, she joined the Johns Hopkins Carey School of Business as a professor of finance, of financial crisis in 2013. She's a professor of financial crises. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's job security right there. Uh, all right, so let's, let's move on here to this next one. We're getting closer to the boxes all the time. Uh, what is this? Oh, oh, goodness. Oh, gracious. Okay. Okay, you're coming to me a little late here. Uh, this is, uh, I never got an advanced copy of this, and this is, only now am I getting the finished copy. This is Sarah Lodge's book, Inventing Edward Lear. Uh, Edward Lear wrote some of the best-loved poems in English, including The Owl and the Pussycat. But the father of nonsense was uh, was far from far more than a poet. He was a naturalist, a brilliant landscape painter, an experimental travel writer, and an accomplished composer. In this book, the author presents the fullest account yet of Lear's passionate engagement in the intellectual, social, and cultural life of his times. And I've heard all that. I've 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 watched this thing rack up publicity. Uh, I just haven't been a part of it myself. I should have gotten an advanced copy of this thing months ago. Uh, but better late than never. This is something that I will read tonight uh, because it's you know it's a 2018 release. This major got a lot of critical attention, but none by, none from me. Uh, so I want to know about it. Uh, okay, now we go on to the box. The first of the boxes is from W. W. Norton, my favorite non-Penguin publisher. Uh, they have a, they have to work pretty hard uh, to displease Steve. <laughs> so so let they, they have an absolutely first-rate editorial crew there. Uh, so oh okay all right. Uh, yeah, this is a January release. We saw this already on this channel. Uh, this comes out on January 1st, <laughs> the very first day of the year. I don't know if that's a Tuesday or not. Uh, but this is by Alan, uh, Alan Demerger, and it's translated by Teresa Lavender Fagan. I really wish that my name were Steve Lavender Fagan. That is a fantastic name. Uh, this is The Persecution of the Knights Templar, with a great classic cover design. Very nice. Even the, the red tapestry on the back as well. And it's all about uh, the Knights Templar have been fascinating people for two centuries. I, it's never worked with me, I confess. I have read so many books about the Knights Templar and about them being stabbed in the back by the societies that they were, that they were serving and their prowess in battle and their financial clout. I've read so many books about them, and I've never caught the Templar fever that, that, uh, that existed long before Dan Brown. And has you know it continues to generate books like this every year, and I haven't I haven't read this book yet. I'm, I I hope all the time that that the latest book will be the one to do it, 
So maybe, actually, let's see, let's see whose hands I'll be in. Who is Alan de Merger? An honorary senior lecturer at the University of Paris and France's most foremost specialist in the history of the Crusades. Okay. Uh, well, there you go. If he can't do it, nobody can. We'll see if his translator is any good, but I imagine so. All right, so that's uh, that's three finished copies and uh, and some some 2019 releases, and that brings us to this enormous box. I don't know what this is. Uh, if it if it blows up, well, then it's on camera, <laughs> uh, and it is it is taped all over. Let us see what this is. Oh God! I, <laughs> I just realized. I just realized that I was using when I was using the scissors. I was cutting towards me instead of away from me. And I know already at least six. I know already the six people who will email me and say, "Don't do that. You gave me the willies." Oh, here I'm doing it the right way this time. Okay, <laughs> I'm cutting away from myself this time. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Uh, about 150 mothers-in-law <laughs> watch this channel. <laughs> uh, so what is this? It's not a book. <gasps> oh. <laughs> you have got to be kidding me. What on earth? Oh my god. You've got to be kidding me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Actually, see this? This is Bigfoot. Look at this thing. <laughs> oh my god. This is a gigantic Bigfoot. <laughs> Why? Who is it? Is that? Oh my god, Frida's going crazy. <laughs> what is that, baby girl? Huh? <laughs> Look at the card. Look at what the card says. You? <laughs> Oh my god! It's a gigantic Bigfoot! Oh, what? <laughs> I have the best viewers in the world! <laughs> the card consists entirely of ROAR! ROAR! <laughs> <laughs> oh my god okay well I didn't think the day's highlight would be non-bookish but it certainly is <laughs> will you look at that amazing okay I'm gonna I'm gonna free the uh, the tag here in the leg because I want to know everything there is to know about this thing oh my god I don't know what I'm gonna I don't know how I'm going to keep this safe from Frida. <laughs> she, she, she's she's going to want a word with this thing. What is that? Huh? What is it, baby bean? <laughs> you should see her. She's vibrating with rage. <laughs> uh, so what is... What do we have here? <laughs> this is actually manufactured by the animal planet. Uh, <laughs> and it is a giant Bigfoot. Do we have any information on it here? No? Animal Planet brings the animal kingdom to life every day, on screen, online, and in products like this one. Let your instincts take over and your imagination go wild. <laughs> okay. This clearly makes the construction of a bookish Steve Pyramid slightly anticlimactic. <laughs> I'm not, there isn't any competing with this, and I wouldn't want to try. <laughs> I have the best subscribers in the world. <laughs> okay, I'm going to wrap this up. I need to establish some sort of detente between my little schnauzer and this Bigfoot. <laughs> I'm going to go do that now and try and hope for peace. <laughs> uh, but I will see you soon. Thank you, Booktube.